Okay, so here's my plan for today. Over the last two weeks, we've done support vector machines, we've done ensembles. I kind of didn't give you enough time and thought when we were talking about support vector machine notebook. And I have another notebook for ensembles. So I want to mostly concentrate on these notebooks today. But first, if there's any questions about ensembles and theoretical concerns that you've been struggling with, this would be a great time to review that. So I'm going to let you have a moment to both think about whether there's something that you're struggling with with ensembles you want to ask about, and also make sure that you've loaded up these notebooks from the repo, support vector machines and bagging. Okay. Do 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 Anybody know that theme song? Okay. All right, let me, uh, while you're thinking about whether you have any questions, let me just say what we did cover on the support vector machines notebook is all the early stuff, looking at like differences in support vectors and different C values and showing that the support vector machines can indeed be pretty robust to noise, in this case to subsampling the data on the left versus all the data on the right. Right? That's a kind of noise. We also talked about these kernels and how they can do things. But this is where we left off just when it was really getting interesting. This chunk right here, where instead of using little blobs, I first load up the Palmer Penguins data set. I want to take a moment in here to really talk details about what's going on in the code and why that code is going to be super useful to you. Okay. So before I do that, by this point, anybody's had any chance to come up with any thoughts or questions about ensembles? Okay. So this code, this example, is doing a few very important things that you are going to want to apply in your own work with scikit-learn. And I need to make sure you understand what's going on here. Okay. First off, let me just kind of, I already loaded this up. So let's see. Did I? Yeah, okay. I haven't done anything with it. So this is the Palmer Penguins data set. We've seen it before. It's 300 some penguins with different measurements of bill length, bill depth, flipper length, body mass. And there's one categorical variable, which is sex. Okay? These are the x values loaded up here. And if you remember when we when we did this, right, you've you've seen this before. Those penguins actually let's do hue equals species. So those penguins, you can pretty clearly see that you got to be able to separate out the different species of penguin, right? The different species of penguin are our predictor variables. We're trying, given a penguin's measurement, to predict what species it belongs to. 
So it seems obvious from this kind of a pair plot that you should be able to do that reasonably well. Sure, there's a lot of overlap of chin strap and Adelie penguins, the blue and the orange, in some variables. But in other variables, they seem pretty separable, right? So, all right, this is our task. Predict species given these inputs. Now, we've got real numbers here. And some of those real numbers are magnitude in the thousands and some of them are magnitude in the tens. So what should we be doing to our variables? Louder? Standardize them, right? Like, do something to make sure they're the same order of magnitude. Because if they're not, then the high magnitude variable is going to overwhelm the predictions, right? The predictions are going to be based largely on the high magnitude variable and the low magnitude variables are going to have very little influence on prediction. OK? So we know we need to standardize in some fashion. And there's a lot of different choices for standardization. Just a reminder. Whoops. I didn't want this. I wanted scalar. Sure, we'll start with bagging classifier and we'll just get from there. So you have a lot of choices. One of them is to use the standard scalar, which is just a z-score, right? It's going to turn everything into zero mean, plus or minus the number of standard deviations for that column. Right? But you can do other things. There's the min-max scalar, just scales everything between 0 and 1. That works, too. Right? Maybe you've got some reason to prefer a min-max scalar over a standard deviation, probably because the thing, a z-score only makes sense if the thing is normally distributed whereas min-max would make sense if it was linear scale, but non-normal, OK? Rank scaling's pretty good, too. Rank scaling's another thing that you can do. There's all these different choices. You should absolutely explore these docs and play with these different choices. For instance, while I'm talking. <laughs> all right. We also have this categorical variable, sex. What do we do with categorical variables? One hot. When do we not one hot? When it's ordinal, right? Like if it's a categorical variable that is actually ordinal, like a Likert scale, one to five, how much do you like this class? You don't have to one hot that, because there's ordinality in there. But there's no way in which female is bigger than male or vice versa. So we're going to one hot encode this. OK. So you have seen various ways to do this. But let's see what I consider like basically plug and play code. All right. So there is this object in scikit-learn called a column transformer. A column transformer lets you set up automatic methods for dealing with different variable types. So what we see right here is this thing where we use the selector object to try to find everything that's got a d-type of object. D-types, if you don't remember your Python, we get d types built in that are like integer, float, and object are our most common things. And the problem is, is that object is very generic, right? Object could mean literally like an object, like a scikit-learn estimator, but it also very, it's what happens when you have strings, right? Strings are objects in Python. So selecting something for d-type object 
if you have a data frame, assuming your data frame doesn't contain any actual like programming object oriented objects, but just strings, it's going to end up selecting the string columns. And the string columns are, at least in this case, are categorical variables. Right? And the numerical column is anything that's not an object. Now, you can look on the docs for how the selector function works. You can do more complicated stuff than this. But basically, what we've got is we've got a list of numerical columns, and we've got a list of categorical columns. OK? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to set up this pre-processing object that's of object type column transformer. Column transformer is an object implemented in scikit-learn. And to instantiate it, all we need is some tuples. Essentially, what we get is first we put in a name. The name is just for us. It's just for our own labeling, right? So I put in the name one hot. We put in a transformer type. In this case, the one hot encoder preprocess preprocessor object, right? I made a one hot encoder object. I stick the one hot encoder in here. And then here I give it a list of columns. These categorical columns are the ones that are selected by the categorical column selector. And that selector is going to be everything that's a D-type object. So for most pandas data frames, where things are either numeric or string, depending upon the column, this code is copy-paste. Right? This code will one hot encode every column that happens to have strings in it, and it will z-score, or standard scalar, it's the same thing, anything that happens to be numeric. Now, obviously, you can change this, right? You can use a min-max scalar there instead of a standard scalar or whatever you want to do. You can also add, of course, more different transformers, different rule sets for different things. You can do them automatically, like with these selectors, or you can just, instead of using the numerical columns list as a selector, you can just make a list with those column names. Okay. Does this make sense to people? OK. Because here's the big deal, right? This column transformer, this isn't being used yet. We've just defined it. The fun thing is pipelines. Now, my memory is absolute bollocks, OK? So have I talked about pipelines at all in class? I'm going to take that as a big no. OK. So Scikit implements this pipeline. A pipeline is literally just a list of operations. And the first thing in that list is going to get executed. And then the next thing in that list is going to get executed. And then the next. And the output from element one is going to go into element two. And element two is going to go into element three, and so on and so forth. It is basically what the name says. It's a pipeline. The brilliant thing about scikit pipelines is that they implement the scikit estimator interface. Every pipeline has a dot fit and a dot predict. So anywhere in a scikit-learn-based program, you would use a linear regression or a support vector machine. You can replace that with a pipeline. And what you can do with pipelines is you can put together your transformation of your features with your machine learning model with anything else that you need to do. Right? Maybe you're doing something like 
oh, I'm going to take my data in. I'm going to transform all of the numeric variables into a principal components analysis. And I'm going to use the principal components as the input to my support vector machine. That's a pipeline, right? We can set up those stages. And then when you take this pipeline and stick it into a cross-validation, well, it just, it's just literally one line. It's, you know, cross-val score this pipeline, please. So we're going to see all that right now, OK? But what we've done is we've taken our column transformer to transform our columns, and we've stuck it in as the first step in the pipeline. So any data coming in gets transformed. And then after transformation, that data goes through a support vector classifier. Okay? So you should play with this while I'm talking, because me talking is much less impactful than you running this. By the way, as it says right here, this is going to take at least a minute to run. Okay. All right. So now we have a pipeline which contains a transformation of our features and a support vector classifier. We want to do some model selection. Woohoo! And guess what is your project about? Model selection, right? OK. So support vector machines, if you remember, we have a lot of different kernels we could use. The linear kernel, it's got no hyperparameters. It's just linear. Well, actually, it's not true. It does have one hyperparameter that we call C, right? And that's the hard margin, soft margin trade-off. Remember that? So when C is a really big number, we care an awful lot about the hinge error. And that hinge error tries to drive out misclassification. It also tries to drive data out of the gutters, right? But the size of those gutters is also controlled by that C, right? When C is big, we care about misclassification and driving errors out of the gutters. But we let the machine learning system shrink the gutter size when our C is a high value. When C is a small value, we force those positive and negative hyperplanes far apart. We make for a really big gutter. But we care relatively less about keeping those gutters clean, because C is a trade-off between those two elements, right? OK. So for a linear support vector machine, the only hyperparameter we've got is the C value. So when we're trying linear support vector machines, we're going to try different values of C. And that's our model selection. OK. Let's say we also want to check out another kind of kernel, like, for instance, a polynomial kernel. Well, when we have a polynomial kernel, we have a lot of different hyperparameters that are available to us. The one that makes the most difference is degree. Degree is the polynomial degree, right? So if degree is 3, then we are, we're fitting a third order polynomial. If degree is 5, it's fifth order. It turns out there's a couple of other things, too. Gamma is a multiplier on the front of the polynomial. So it's like constant times polynomial. This coef 0 is a constant term. And we still have C, right? C is always there with support vector machines. Hard margin, high C, soft margin, low C. So this polynomial 
style support vector machine, this polynomial kernel, has way more hyperparameters. So I commented out the coef zero, but the rest of them are here. Okay. And lastly, we have the radial basis function, that thing that looks like a normal, you know, a multidimensional normal distribution, this kind of Gaussian. Okay. Those kinds of Gaussians, well, it's an exponential, right? And the exponential has got something like a standard deviation on it. And that's gamma in scikit-learn, right? This is like the standard deviation term on a, uh, a Gaussian. So for radial basis functions, I have two hyperparameters, gamma, which is like that standard deviation, and c. OK. By now, maybe you've figured out what's going on here. I'm defining a dictionary which defines the grid search, right? So this search space is a list of dictionaries. And each dictionary has one of the kernels in it. <coughs> Excuse me. I ate lunch right before I came here, and some of that was in my teeth, apparently, and down my throat. <coughs> All right. So this dictionary defines the search for a linear support vector machine. This dictionary defines the search for a polynomial support vector machine. And this one, the radial basis function. And again, it's being enclosed just by a list. How are these names working? Well, classifier, classifier is that guy right there. Underneath classifier, it goes double underscore kernel. Kernel, if you looked at a support vector classifier here, let me actually do that. Okay, so this support vector classifier has elements like C. When you don't initialize it, C defaults to 1. It has elements like kernel, defaults to radial basis. OK? So this double underscore says, go to the pipeline. Under pipeline, grab the classifier element. And inside the classifier, double underscore, Grab the parameter C. OK? So if we had parameters that we wanted to set on make features or anything else, we could grab it by its name. It could be make features here. And then double underscore whatever parameter of this preprocessor you wanted to change. So you can reach into any of the elements of a pipeline. And inside the elements of a pipeline, you can reach down into any of their parameters by using this scheme. OK? Right, so that's the naming space. The namespace shows you how to grab and change the various elements of this thing. What do we get on the right side? Well, we're giving it the kernel we want it to be. Great. Anybody know what this does? NP log space. Was that a hand or no? Just itching your nose. Okay, sorry. <laughs> what do you think it does? Anybody? Yeah. Can you say a little bit louder? 
You've got it. So it's going to make a list of numbers. That list of numbers is going to be, in this case, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the 0th, 10 to the 1st. Right? It's doing it in logarithmic progression from minus 3 to positive 2 in 11 steps. Okay, 11 steps from 10 to the minus 3 until 10 to the second. So this kind of logarithmic progression is pretty common as a first cut of model selection, right? First, like if I'm just trying out model selection, I don't know if this parameter, like, is it like really, really big values and really small values are different? Or is there going to be like fine-grained distinctions? Well, you never want to start with making fine-grained distinctions because you have no idea, right? You could just completely miss an important part of the search space. And you don't have enough time to do like from 1 10,000th to 10,000 in steps of 0.01, right? How many, how many runs would that be? It's ridiculous. So first, you make big jumps through the search space at logarithmic progression. Then if you see like a region of the search space that seems much, much better than the other regions, you can do a second run with linear steps in smaller chunks near that location in the search space. Does that make sense? So like if it, if it turned up that like 10 to the first was roughly speaking, 10 was roughly speaking about the right C parameter, and you wanted to hone in on is it like, you know, between 5 and 20, like in jumps of 1, which one's best, then you could do that a second time after you've determined that around 10 is the right, the right place to be. Okay? So we've defined log progressions in everything except for degree. Degree is going to be a linear range 2 to 14. OK. So I've defined a search space here. And now it's this easy. Grid search, I give it my pipeline. I give it my search space. I tell it to use five-fold cross-validation. All right, now I've got my grid search object. It hasn't been run yet. It's just been created. The grid search object has the pipeline. It has the search space that it wants to execute. Split up my training and testing sets. Tell my grid search object, this is my grid search, tell it to fit on the training set. OK, you do that. Has anybody executed this or played around with this while I've been blah blahing? No? <laughs> Again, what you're going to get is this. So when you see the grid search object, after the grid search has been done, on my computer it took about a minute to execute, you're going to have this object, this best model, is going to be filled up with data. Right? It knows what it searched, and it knows the holdout data set performance, the k-fold cross-validation performance of every single one of those parameters. Okay? And it knows which one is the best model. So ugh, I hate the fact that this does this to me when I, OK. So if I tell the, the model, you know, give me the best params, best model has a field dot best params, the parameters that perform the best for this were C of 10 with a linear kernel. If I wanted to see how good everything was, I can check 
oh, sorry, um, CV results. This is, this is the cross-validation results. For every single one of those parameters we tried, we've got this huge dictionary that contains all the things that were tried and the results with each one of them. Okay? This is not very useful, obviously, to look through manually. But encased in here is all the run data. And you can extract that run data after it's been grid searched. And you can get out various kinds of things. OK. Um, so once you've got the best model, it's just hanging out, right? So when you see best model, best model, remember, best model is a grid search object. It's a grid search object. But the funny thing about grid search objects is that they act like classifiers. If it's been fit, then calling a grid search object dot predict will use the best params. It will automatically use the best params for you. So that's how I can see that my best fit model out of the entire grid search has an accuracy of 99% on the test set. And when we look at the confusion matrix on the test set, we have just one confused little penguin. It's actually an Adelie penguin that we thought was a chin strap. You get all these other things like you know, precision score and recall score per true label. Right? So this is the chin strap precision and recall. This support over here, the support, of course, is how many penguins of that type exist in the test data. So there's 35 Adelies, 23 chin straps, 25 Gen 2s in the data, test set data. OK? So how could we unpack that data and do more visualizations, right? Let me just show you, like, here's some random website that shows you how to unpack data out of a cross-validation, uh, sorry, out of a grid search object, right? You're trying a bunch of decision trees, and you want to see max depth versus the accuracy score and the interaction between max depth on the tree and the minimum samples on a leaf? Well, you can unpack that CV results object, this thing over here. Where'd it go? Over here. There it is. Right? Our grid searcher has this CV results thing. You can unpack it and make a data frame. The data frame has, like, there's so much stuff, like I said. Like, it tells you how long it took to fit mean score time, right? It tells you what the score is. You've got all the things. So you can do stuff like, like what they did. We can plot C value of a classifier versus score with it colored by what kind of kernel it is. OK? So this is accuracy score by default. You can see that as the C parameter bumps up, you go to perfect very quickly. And you can see that RBF and polynomial never get to perfect, whereas linear does. Because it turns out, again, we looked at the pair plots earlier, right? These penguins are easily separatable. And so the, you know, the more complicated models make it too complicated. You should just put a line down there thing. OK? So 
who's got some questions or worries, or what have you been playing with while I've been talking? One of those afternoons, huh? Really, everybody understood pipelines and preprocessors perfectly, and you can just kind of blindly program them now? Yeah. Or at least you know where to go copy-paste. OK, let me point you at one thing that's super important about using a pipeline. It prevents you from making a major F up that people often make when they're beginning machine learning stuff. Feature transforms, like a standard scalar. I cannot tell you how many research papers I have seen from people with PhDs, where what they do is I take all the data and I z-score all the data, and then I break up all the data into training set, test set, blah, blah. What's the problem with doing that? What is wrong about the procedure I just described? Say again? The Z scores are based on all the data. That is the problem. Why is that a problem? Exactly. The z-score, the standard deviation that you're refitting everything to, it's based on data that's ending up in your test set. That means you're leaking information about the test set into your training process. It means that you are going to end up overfitting your classifier or whatever it is you're doing, right? By using information about data points that are in test to create a transformation, and that transformation affects how training happens, right? Like, what if, what if in test set there was like this crazy number that was like twice as big as everything else in the data? If that's a training set data point, and that crazy outlier ends up setting the z-score for training set, then the z-score is different, right? So that's why. That is the leakage of information that so typically happens, because it just makes sense to people to do all of my data transformation right up front, get it out of the way, and then go break up into test, train, validate, or whatever I'm doing. But that's wrong. That is overfitting, and that will lead to inflated estimates of your error. I've done that. I got, like, in 2015 or so, I got six months into a project, and I was making my my advisor so, so happy with these great results. And then I realized I was doing this. And the instant I removed this problem, my classification errors doubled, OK? That's how big a mistake it was. It was on genomic data, OK? It can happen. So wait, what does a pipeline do that prevents this? Well, your preprocessor is in the pipeline. So when you take that pipeline element and you run it through a grid search, or instead of a grid search, if you run it through cross-val score, just a cross-validation instead of a grid search, it automatically, for you, only fits the transformation on the training set. The transform gets fit on the training set just like everything else. Fit the transform on the data set, fit the model on the training set. Then that fitted transform, the z-scores that are being used there, gets used on the test set without being refit. 
because Sidekick knows to do it right. It prevents you from accidentally doing it wrong. OK. So um, I want to encourage you to play around with this. There's after the penguin data, there's another data set which is much harder to separate, breast cancer data, trying to predict from uh, some sort of microscopy measurements with features, whether or not cells are cancerous or not. Take a look at this. It's the same code, different data set. Maybe play around with trying to visualize what are the best parameters. You can make heat maps, right, and show test set performance for two different hyperparameters. If you Google, you will find tutorials on how to make these heat maps. And you could do a heat map for, you know, like uh, RBF. RBF only has two uh, hyperparameters, right? Gamma and C. So you could plot RBF, gamma, and C and make a heat map of performance. See if you can work that out on your own. OK. In 10 minutes, then, I want to talk a little bit about the scikit-learn ensemble methods. So the first thing is scikit implements a, something that I think of as a wrapper, this bagging classifier. Bagging classifier is a wrapper that can take anything. You can stick a pipeline inside it. You can stick a decision tree inside it. You can stick a k-nearest neighbors inside it. Right? Any scikit-learn estimator can be stuck inside this wrapper and make it a bagging ensemble. All you got to do is pass that in. You can tell it various kinds of things, right? So what do these things mean, right? Max samples, max features. Well, this is a really excellent time to go take a look at the docs. If I remember correctly, I may not, Max features is like with uh, random forests, right? It subsets features, if I remember correctly. But you should double check me. And it's fairly simple. Throwing a, this at this data set. So by the way, what is this data set? We should take a look at it. Um, have my toolbars off because another classroom I'm in is just a nightmare VGA projector that you can't see anything on. OK. Um, on what I meant to do. Uh, all right, this isn't worth it. But uh, this is a data set that's medium separated, OK? I, can't I don't know why I didn't have this in the frickin' notebook. OK, but um, so at any rate, again, estimators all implement fit. They also all implement score. And score gives you, in this case, I passed it the test set. And you can see that the performance is 0.7318. You could also like, use the classification report that we used in the last thing. right? Anything you want to do. I'm just showing you different aspects of Scikit. OK. So random forests. Well. What's the deal with random forests? They're decision tree-based bagging classifiers that do 
their subsetting not just in the bootstrap samples, but also in the features. And you can set them up to have, well, actually, I think in Scikit, you only have one choice. And that's to have subsets of features at every node. But there's two other kinds of uh, decision tree things that you can do. You can do an individual decision tree. You can do a random forest decision tree. And there's another ensemble called an extra trees classifier where in extra trees, they get extra randomness. So remember decision trees, you, you look for the threshold that's best for each one of those individual features, right? You're doing an exhaustive search, check all the features, look at all the possible thresholds. Extra trees is extra random because it builds the trees with random thresholds. Isn't that crazy? So you don't find the best threshold, you find a random threshold. And that extra randomness as it's just slightly better than chance, but it's extra randomness, so, it's, so it, uh, on average, gives you less overfit classifiers. So you can do all three of those. Super easy. And you can see that the extra trees is a little bit better than the random forest. The other thing you'll see here is that these are not instant because they're decision tree based, and decision trees have exhaustive search. But they're not terrible. Like, to give you some context, I was doing random forests on genomic data that had thousands of variables and hundreds of samples, and it would take like two minutes, okay, for a random forest classifier. Okay, boosting, right? Boosting is that setup that we've already talked about where we build sequentially. Instead of bootstrap resamples, we're going to build classifier one and then train classifier two to do better on the errors that classifier one made, right? The simple, A to boost, okay? So this one is the best yet of all of our ensembles, and that is typical, okay? So a decision tree gets you 72%, a random forest gets you to 87, the extra trees, extra randomness gets you to 89, and here we get to 94 with Ada Boost. So again, circa 2015, 2017, Boosting algorithms are state of the art in terms of tabular data. This is tabular data, right? Anything that goes into a pandas data frame is tabular data. Okay, the last bit is gradient boosted trees. Okay, gradient boosting classifier is slow, all right? Generally speaking, for large data sets, especially for large N data sets, but for large numbers of features too, you probably need to avoid gradient boosting classifier. But histogram gradient boosting is an implementation of the same algorithm as in light GBM. What is it doing? It's breaking up continuous data into discrete chunks, all right? So instead of having, for like data that runs between one and 10,000, having to try every threshold in between one and 10,000, what it does is it breaks it up into 256 discrete chunks from one to 10,000. And then we just have to try 256 possible thresholds, right? It's pretty simple as an idea. Discretize a continuous number. It means you gotta try fewer thresholds. 
it speeds things up dramatically for large data sets. But other than that, it's all the same, my friends. At this point, it's almost boring to show you any given scikit-learn classifier, right? Because it only looks like, OK, I just need a different name here. I just need to understand what are these hyperparameters and settings, which is a matter of looking at the docs. I just need to pick reasonable values for these things. And then it's just dot fit, dot predict, or dot fit, dot score, or stick this bastard inside a grid search. Right? It's the same stuff over and over and over again. OK. No questions at all? You've been great. I hope you enjoy your weekend and get some sleep or some fun. Asta.